Major breaking news out of the city of Chicago, a major oral argument in front of what should be a favorable pro 2A panel of three judges involving Cook County's ban on so-called assault weapons, which are just semi-automatic rifles. Nevertheless, I'm going to warn you now, and this is not going to be pretty, members of that three-judge panel seem intent on wanting to beclown themselves as jurists. Shocking information we're going to go over. Embarrassing information if they act on it when we get right back. You're not going to want to miss this one. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of the new law review piece in the Georgetown Journal of Law and Public Policy entitled, Dangerous But Not Unusual, Mistakes Commonly Made by Courts in Post-Bruin Litigation. Check out the link to it down below. Very important law review article. I think everyone in the Second Amendment community will be reading this, including uh, law clerks, lawyers, scholars, and historians, and the like. So check it out if you want a detailed analysis of how you apply the Second Amendment to the various gun control laws in America today. I think it's very important. All right, folks. So before we talk about this or or argument this morning in the Seventh Circuit out of Chicago, I just want to mention to all, give you the heads up, this Saturday I will be speaking at the Federalist Society on the Second Amendment. I will be introduced by Judge Amal Thapar, who, of course, has been on this show before. Uh, Judge Thapar, very important judge. Uh, Looking forward to that panel. Panel discussion with also David Thompson of Cooper and Kirk and uh, Professor William Merkel of the University of Charleston School of Law. So it'll be a very good discussion back and forth on the Second Amendment. And I will give a very important speech to the Federalist Society um, about the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, and of course, Bruin and Rahimi. Uh, I will put links to it down below on this video as well as uh, tweeted out on X at Four Boxes Diner. So check that out on Saturday. And if you miss it, I will send out around the recording of it uh, next week. All right, folks, so let's turn to today's oral argument in the Veramontes case, which is a case brought, I believe, by the Firearms Policy Coalition and by the Second Amendment Foundation. The Veramontes case versus Cook County deals with a Cook County ban on semi-automatic rifles. Uh, This argument was in front of what should be a favorable three-judge panel, but we're going to get to that in one moment. Specifically, the three judges are Judge uh, Diane Sykes, who's a George W. Bush appointee, uh, Michael Brennan, who's a Donald Trump appointee, who wrote that powerful dissent in the Bevis case, uh, which was the case where the two-to-one decision was against the Second Amendment, where Judge Easterbrook and Judge Wood got the Second Amendment wrong in the Bevis case. Uh, But Judge Michael Brennan, who was on today's panel, wrote the dissent, and he seems to understand the Second Amendment better than a lot of those other judges, certainly better than Judge Easterbrook and Judge Wood. And then, of course, we had uh, Judge Amy St. Eve. Judge St. Eve was on the panel. So you had three judges on the panel. This is actually probably the best three-judge panel that you could hope for in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. So I had high hopes going into this oral argument, and to some degree, they were a little bit dashed because of a series of goofy, silly questions prompted by or asked by Judge Amy St. Eve that suggest strongly to me that her, uh, either her chambers, her law clerks, or she was not adequately prepared for this argument. Now, I could be wrong, but she asked a series of questions that seemed to suggest that she wasn't familiar with the most basic premise of this case, which is the factual and historical record of the case itself. Specifically, Judge St. Eve asked a series of questions about why the Second Amendment plaintiffs had failed, allegedly failed, to put in the lower court record in the district court various information to show that semi-automatic rifles are in common use by Americans for lawful purposes, that they're not predominantly used in the military. In fact, no military in the world that I'm aware of issues simply purely semi-automatic firearms at all uh, in terms of rifles, set, set, set aside the issue of handguns. This is a rifle case. And that, of course, criminals generally don't use long guns or rifles to commit crimes. They prefer handguns, which, of course, are already protected arms under the Second Amendment thanks to the 2008 decision by the Supreme Court in Heller. Nevertheless, the Judge St. Eve seemed perplexed and kept asking questions about why was certain information not in the lower court record. And what is embarrassing about this 
and raises the issue of whether or not Judge St. Eve and maybe other members of the court, I hope not, but whether Judge St. Eve and maybe other members of this panel may beclown themselves if they write an opinion that goes along the way that says that the Second Amendment plaintiffs failed to prove their case, um, they seem to be absurd because it's pretty clear that the evidence they were talking about is the most basic evidence that everyone in the Second Amendment community is familiar with uh, that you would put into the lower court record. And indeed, the attorney for the, uh, law, the the attorney for the Second Amendment plaintiffs specifically said that virtually all of the information, all the critical information that Saint Judge St. Eve was asking about was indeed proffered and given to and part of the district court record in cross motions for summary judgment. So I don't know what's going to happen here, but it's simply absurd. Let me play a little back and forth here just to see the absurdity of this, and you'll tell me what you think. Beavis left room for a different decision based on the record, and there is a substantial record in this case. We built a record showing that there is specific military applications for automatic fire involving putting down suppressive fire, engaging in fire superiority, certain military applications for that, and also making clear that the semi-automatic assault right, weapons, supposedly assault weapons that are at issue in this case, are the type of common firearms that everyday people would use in their homes for self-defense. That is the standard. Well, it's that my Beavis understanding that there's forth. no, there was really no record development on your side in terms of um, expert um, witnesses or reports or um, production of any kind of factual or evidentiary basis for the argument that you're making. Your yeah. your record, quote unquote, came in response to um, the other side's. Uh, Rule 56 statement, as I understand we, the we, we record here. We produced over 2,000s of pages of legislative fact materials in discovery. And just for purposes of this case, these are legislative facts. These are not the sort of facts that are at issue in uh, a, a typical sort I'm of case. I'm troubled, Mr. We, Patterson, by, the, by the, that. Um, you, you say you produced documents, but many of the documents that you're relying on before us weren't mentioned below in the 56.1s. You're bringing them to us for the first time on appeal, which is troubling. And I know you've labeled them as legislative facts, but you've put in surveys, which are so often subject to Daubert challenges, and a lot of materials that the district court didn't have the opportunity to take the first run at on summary judgment. That, that's not true, Your Honor. The vast majority of the documents we've cited here, we can prevail ignoring anything we've brought to this court for the first time. I have we, a, a list of articles that you're, and surveys you're relying on here that you did not cite in your summary judgment briefing. If, if you look at both our affirmative summary judgment brief, which this court says you I can did. do in Wise, Wise Miller, yes, we, we put all our legislative facts in the argument section of the brief. And then in response to their statement of material facts, we, again, included over 2,000 pages of materials, including the NSSF Producing surveys. the materials, though, for the district court is very different than relying on them in your summary judgment and presenting them to the district court for the district court to consider. And, and that's, I find that troubling here. Well, again, these, again, this court can blind itself to the materials we're bringing to this court for the first time. The Wallace papers, the Chapman book, the English, the NSSF surveys, the Washington Post surveys, the data about the criminal misuse of these firearms, those are all in the materials that we submitted to the district court. So this is not a case in which you know, we're blindsiding the district court. And in any event, these are legislative facts. The only thing that is required is due process for the other side, notice an opportunity to be heard. They've had that in briefing here. And similarly in Heller, when the Supreme Court announced- I don't have everything- Sorry, Your Honor. From the summary judgment before me now, but I don't think you cited the Wallace papers or, or included them in your 56.1s. That's just one example. The Wallace papers are in our 56.1, it's at, and the Wallace lethality article is at record 1835. The Wallace myths article is at record 1904. The Chapman article is at record 2327. The Chapman books at record 3116. Just for example, all of these materials are in the materials that we submitted to the district court. We had a response to a specific finding of fact, one of their, one of their findings of fact, uh, 270, 
about automatic fire, and we specifically said that it's useful in battlefield situations which call for suppressing fire. So we did not choose to do experts because it's not required in this context. In Heller, which established this dangerous and unusual standard, the Solicitor General, in its brief, said we need a remand so we can develop evidence on whether these are the type of firearms that people need. Ironically, the other side in that case was saying people should use rifles instead of handguns for self-defense. And the Supreme Court said, no, we're going to do that here. And what it relied on, when the Supreme Court said that handguns are the most common weapon used for self-defense, it cited to the Court of Appeals ruling in that case, which was decided on a motion to dismiss the district court, cited the Court of Appeals ruling, which in turn cited a survey, a published survey by Gary Kleck, saying that handguns are used for self-defense frequently. So it was the same type of material that the Supreme Court relied on in Heller and Bruin too. All right, so the reason why this is perplexing is that as you can see, according to the lawyer for the Second Amendment plaintiffs, and I believe him because again, the evidence he's talking about is really right down the middle, basic evidence that's been around for years. So I'm sure that would have been submitted in the lower court if they said so. And that's what I would expect for a major law firm that does Second Amendment litigation. And the law firm that handled this case, I, I think the law firms were all very familiar with the Second Amendment. There are no newbies here. Which suggests that Judge uh, St. Eve uh, either was not familiar with the record, hadn't read the bench memo prepared by the law clerks assuming that occurred, or someone simply dropped the ball. So I hope now that Judge Eve St. Eve has been kind of educated on the record, she will go back and nail it down. Now beyond that, assuming that they don't screw that up and think wrongly, based on this record that I heard, that the Second Amendment plaintiffs uh, sandbagged the government, let's move on to the other stuff that was discussed. One of the issues here, as you know, is that the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals issued that Bevis decision with Judge Easterbrook and Judge Wood. That was the one that Judge Michael Brennan, who was on today's panel, dissented from. So the question is whether or not you apply the Bevis case and the standard they set forth there, or the Heller case of in common use. Now, it's pretty clear to me that the U.S. Supreme Court set forth the Heller case, and that's what you follow in gun ban cases, and the Seventh Circuit simply ignored that and screwed that up. Nevertheless, it shouldn't matter in this case because the three-part test that the Bevis case set forth is clearly satisfied by the Second Amendment plaintiff, specifically that three-part test which occurs, according to Bevis, at the textual level of the Second Amendment, which is totally wrong, but nevertheless, let's set, set the issue aside, at the textual level to show that a semi-automatic rifle like an AR-15 is an arm, as in the right of the people to keep and bear arms, the Bevis test says, the Bevis court said there is three-part test that must be satisfied by the Second Amendment plaintiffs to show that a semi-automatic rifle like an AR-15 is an arm in the text of the Second Amendment. Okay? Now, this is not what the Supreme Court said. This is clearly wrong. But with that said, it doesn't matter because the Bevis standard can be met with AR-15s. Why? The three-part test is simply this. Number one, that the arm that's in dispute here, AR-15s, the semi-automatic rifles, is not predominantly a military weapon. Well, again, this is not the standard under the Supreme Court, but let's pretend it is. It doesn't matter because semi-automatic rifles that are pure semi-automatic rifles are simply not military weapons. If you're issued a weapon in the military that's a rifle, it's going to be at a minimum select fire, right? It's going to be an M16 fully automatic firearm, or it could be a select fire M4, whatever it is, you get the point. A purely semi-automatic rifle is not a military weapon anywhere in the world. And that is well known, well established, and beyond. Number two, the Bevis test also says that these arms are in common use by Americans for self-defense and beyond. And of course, there's no dispute that Americans own tens of millions of these types of semi-automatic rifles for all lawful purposes, including but not limited to self-defense. There's ample evidence of this, not only by uh, many academic sources, but also by the Washington Post survey itself. And the Washington Post is obviously no friend of guns. And then third criteria, which again is not the legal standard in the real world with the Supreme Court, but it's the legal standard in the Seventh Circuit because what the two to one decision of Easterbrook Wood versus Michael Brennan uh, decided in the Bevis case. The other one is to show that, uh, you know, these arms are not used by criminals or not preferred by criminals, which of course they're not because criminals prefer handguns, which everyone has always understood because they're easily to conceal, but it doesn't matter because handguns are fully protected arms. So no matter how you slice it, even under the Bevis test, which is not the law of the land, it shouldn't be, it's not. Nevertheless, even under the Bevis standards, the Second Amendment plaintiffs should prevail in this case. And that was made our, our 
argued quite clearly. But then again, going back to Judge St. Eve, she then brings up during this oral argument another kind of uh, a kind of absurd contention about hey, Second Amendment plaintiffs, where are your expert reports? And I think the lawyer for the Second Amendment did a very good job here to be like, hey, judge, come on. Let's think about this for a moment. We've talked about this on this channel, by the way. How many expert reports were submitted in the Supreme Court's case of Heller? Zero. Because remember, Heller was decided on a motion to dismiss. They did not even have factual discovery. They didn't. Nevertheless, the Heller case, Supreme Court itself, decided Heller and said that you cannot ban handguns even without any expert reports or factual development at all because it's a question, basically a question of law and constitutional law. So you had no need for experts or expert reports in Heller. How many experts and expert reports were used in McDonald in 2010? Zero. Zero. And how many expert reports were used in the case of Catano versus Massachusetts by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2016? Zero. And how many expert reports and expert testimony was used by the United States Supreme Court in the case leading up to the Supreme Court of Nyserpa versus Bruin? Zero. That case also was decided on a motion to dismiss in the lower courts. They never got the factual discovery or experts. And how many expert reports and experts were used in the 2024 decision of United States versus Rahimi in the Supreme Court, zero. So why on earth is Judge St. Eve in the Seventh Circuit today, in the year of our Lord 2024, a few weeks before Thanksgiving 2024, asking about where are your expert reports, Second Amendment plaintiffs? It's like, what's wrong with these people? And I, I'm going to give Judge St. Eve the benefit of the doubt here. Let me tell you what I think is the issue with Judge St. Eve. Before she sat on the U.S. Court of Appeals, for, and this is some inside baseball, the, before Judge St. Eve sat on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, what was she? She was a federal district trial judge. Here I just said a trial judge, which meant that when she was a trial judge, she would deal with discovery, trials, experts, expert reports, findings of fact, and that's all fine. And I think what happens here is they elevate a Judge St. Eve from the district court, trial court, up to the Court of Appeals, and she's looking at this case as if this she's a trial judge in some trial discovery issue. But we're beyond that. And when you're on the Court of Appeals, you're an appellate court like the United States Supreme Court. And if the U.S. Supreme Court can decide Second Amendment cases in favor of the Second Amendment without the need of experts and expert reports, why on earth should you, as a U.S. Court of Appeals judge for the Seventh circuit think you're entitled to apply a different standard are you somehow a superior court to the u.s supreme court no you're actually an inferior court as set forth not by mark smith in the four boxes diner channel you're an inferior court as set forth by article three of the u.s constitution itself you're inferior court compared to the supreme court and if the supreme court doesn't need experts and expert reports why do you the answer is you don't and you shouldn't look for them it's not that hard Nevertheless, if you look at these questions from Judge St. Eve, that is where she's going. Now, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to assume for the sake of argument that she was totally prepared and was just testing the lawyers, and she really knows she's how to do this right, and she's just sort of pushing the lawyers to get to some right answer here, and she's sort of pushing and pulling to see, to, to write a very powerful decision in favor of the Second Amendment and not screw this case up. That's what I'm hoping, and optimistic, cautiously optimistic. Because if you go the other way on some of the grounds that she was articulating, she will, and that panel will beclown itself. They will embarrass themselves and the rest of the federal judiciary for screwing up a case so badly by saying that these evidence is not in the record when it was in the record and articulated by chapter and verse during this argument itself. The only other point I want to make about this is that there was a discussion about why was the record mostly discussing AR-15s and not the other 50 types of firearms uh, that were banned. Easy answer. This is not rocket science. The reality is that the Cook County ban deals with semi-automatic rifles. If you can show that the Bevis test or the Heller test is satisfied with AR-15s, those are the bulk of the semi-automatic rifles. But at the end of the day, whether you're dealing with an AK-47, an AR-15, uh, or any of these kinds of weapons that are used by Americans for you know common use, civilian use, lawful purposes, you're only dealing with a very, you're all the same thing. These are semi-automatic rifles 
Uh, they're all the same, you know, whether or not it's a Land Rover or a Fiat or a Chevrolet or a Ford. Okay, yeah, they're different brands, different makes, different models, different paint jobs. Yes, all true. But at the end of the day, you're just dealing with a gas operated motor vehicle. Likewise, there's no need to put in evidence about every single one of the 50 some odd firearms banned by the city of Cook County, or by Cook County, I should say, when all you're really talking about is semi-automatic rifles. And if you can satisfy the various tests, just talking about AR-15s, then you can certainly satisfy if you start adding on to those numbers involving AR-15s to the other kinds of semi-automatic rifles, because we know the reality of semi-automatic rifles in America are commonly used by Americans for all purposes, including but not limited to self-defense, and they're rarely used by criminals, as we know from DOJ, FBI uh, crime data, even though you're not supposed to consider Consider that because that would be interest balancing. But nevertheless, if you want to sort of in the back of your mind, think about it as a judge. That's the reality on the ground. Uh, the difference between the number of deaths associated with handguns and Heller through homicides versus rifles. It's orders of magnitude. More people die with homicides with handguns than with rifles. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court in Heller said handguns are, uh, cannot be banned. So obviously you cannot ban rifles. Same concept. This is not a heavy lift. This is not hard. You don't need to be an Oxford Don to figure this stuff out. Uh, a lot of people can. And these federal judges should be able to do it. And we will see what happens. But I will tell you, I was not impressed by a lot of this RO argument by the quality of the questions from the panel. I'm going to give them the benefit of that and assume for the sake of argument, they were just trying to push the lawyers and they weren't actually revealing uh, ignorance of their own. But only time will tell. And if they screw this case up and they get it wrong, I will be the first person to call them out and explain to them why I think they have beclowned themselves. But again, I'm hoping that does not occur. Uh, they, I hope they issue the right decision. Of course, ultimately, we hope the U.S. Supreme Court grants cert in Snope and all these cases will be moot because the Supreme Court will resolve the AR-15 issue, the semi-automatic rifle issue in our favor is my guess. And that is really what we want is a Supreme Court decision in the next 12 months on this AR-15 ban question. All right, folks, so there you have it. Hope you learned something here today. Make sure you follow me at x at Furbox at Donner. We have over 19,000 followers now. And uh, make sure you subscribe to this video, uh, like this video, subscribe to the channel. And we will see you again very soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.